What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. Today's episode is going to be brought to you by Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. And if you guys haven't been rocking a Mystery Ranch Fireline pack for the entirety of your career, well, that sucks to be you, dog. And check this out, ladies, especially. You need to go over to www.mysteryranch.com because they are making women's specific shaped yokes and belts for your Mystery Ranch Fireline gear. <gasps> what? Mind blown? So ladies, if you are uh, looking for something that's going to fit a, a little bit more specific to your shape, well, I highly, highly, highly recommend and suggest going over to www.mysteryranch.com and checking out all the new swag and gear and yokes and other stuff. Speaking of swag and gear and other stuff, they make two awesome cases, actually backpacks, cases, packs, bags, whatever. Anyways, you're going to be looking for uh, the three-way briefcase and the Urban Assault 21. And why am I saying these two specific packs? Well, that's simple because a portion of the proceeds to these uh, two particular packs are going to go back into funding the Backbone series. And if you haven't applied for the Backbone series, well, I highly suggest you do so. It is awesome. And if you got an awesome story, you want to tell your story, well, now's your opportunity to win a thousand dollar grant to get some more education under your belt and pursue your fire, fire career even farther. So once again, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by our premier coffee sponsor, and that's going to be none other than Hot Shot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. And in addition to Kick-Ass Coffee for Kick-Ass Causes. They make a ton of other stuff, like all the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right, and a bunch of wildland firefighter-themed apparel. It's pretty awesome. It's fun. Uh, some tongue-in-cheek jokes, which I always appreciate. But uh, yeah, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check out their full line of apparel, Kick-Ass Coffee for Kick-Ass Causes, and all the tools of the trade to get your morning started off correctly. In addition to that, go over there and check out some of uh, the Anchor Point merch. Yes, yeah, so if you're looking for some of those Band of Brothers tees or some of those Fire Fiend tees, well, look no further than Asha Brewing. Go check them out. Do it now. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by our friends over at The Ass Movement. Yeah, it's a funny name. It's kind of funny, but uh, it's actually pretty serious. Uh, it stands for the Anti-Surface Shitting Movement, and they are all about spreading the good word about burying your turds. So if you want to uh, go over there and get some sweet swag, some Anti-Surface Shitting memorabilia, some posters, some stickers, some patches, yeah, you can even get a turd trowel if you want to, if you have a problem pooper on your crew. Go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement where you can get all of your poo bearing propaganda needs all in one place. Check this out. Also, you can get another 10% off listeners to this podcast you and get a 10% off their entire order site wide by using the code anchor point ass 10, all one word. So go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by the Smoky Generation, where you will have the opportunity to win a $500 grant to pursue your passion of telling the story of wildland fire. <gasps> Deadline is May 20th. That is right around the corner, ladies and gentlemen. So if you have a compelling story or something that you want to share with the world about wildland fire, not only just here in the United States, but across the world, well, now's your time to do it. Go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and throw your name in the hat so you can get your story told. It doesn't matter if you're a blogger, a writer, a photographer, a cinematographer, anybody who's telling the story of wildland fire, well, now's your opportunity. You have until May 20th. So go over there, put your name in the hat, tell your story, and potentially be selected for one of these Smoky Generation grants. Bethany, I want to applaud you for your efforts over there at the Smoky Generation. You have a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. The views and opinions of this podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency.
What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Hope everybody's doing great. I hope everybody's doing fine. I hope everybody's getting uh, some recovery in from their likely roll down to Region 3. Damn, that was some epic fire behavior down there. I remember uh, the Wall of Fire back in 2011, and it was uh, pretty gnarly, and it looks like fire behavior hasn't changed, but I guess that's kind of what it is. Did see some posts out there with some 60 mile per hour winds. Uh, yeah, gnarly. So for all you folks out there on the line down in Region 3, stay safe and uh, yeah, keep your head on a swivel. As for the show, well, actually, let me pause that real quick. I know I uh, haven't really been releasing episodes lately and there's a reason for that and I uh, don't really want to go into it, but let's just say uh, I'm taking care of myself with some health concerns and uh, yeah, it's a moving target. We still don't know what's going on, but yeah, we'll figure it out. No reason for concern. Hopefully. <laughs> Anyways, today on the show, I've got my good buddy who's been in the news quite a lot lately. Uh, I know Wildfire Today has covered his story. I know that uh, CBS, uh, NBC, uh, yeah, a bunch of major news organizations have covered his story. And you probably likely know where I'm going with this. Today, we're going to be talking about reprisal, the fear of reprisal, and what you can possibly do in case this happens to you. What better person to have on the show to talk about this very subject than my good friend, Mr. Pedro Rios. Welcome to The Anchor Point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Anchor Point Podcast. Today on the show, I've got my good buddy, Pedro Rios. Dude, you got a hell of a story to tell, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? Doing great, man. Got a new setup. You're my uh, test pilot for my new uh, little little setup I got going on here. So yeah, right, yeah. sounds good. Sounding good so far. Yeah, well, good. So hopefully it makes you uh, everybody else sound good as well, especially these remote. I know I've gotten a couple complaints for the uh, remote podcast. So when like we're on Zoom right now, so hopefully mm -hmm. it cleans it up a little bit. But yeah, tell us about yourself, man. Uh, my name is Pedro Rios. I've been uh, I've been in Wildland Fire since 2007. I started out. With, uh, uh, contract crew, uh, hand crew, uh, firestorm, 2007 to 2009, 2010, 11 were kind of dead seasons. So I went back into construction for my last year of construction. Then I came back into fire in 2012. Um, and I was, I was back with, with firestorm, my hand crew. And then from 2012 to 2014, I was with them. 2015 was when I kind of made the big jump to forest service. Uh, I was able to get on a hand crew and an AD, AD crew of all things. I was uh, in the door. And that's uh, how I started I, out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ADs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, there, there's some badass AD crews out there, especially down to Southern California. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I got on AD in a Plymouth National Force. Uh, I got six, six or seven really good evals, and that was enough to get me hired on for the last National Force. Uh, I, I worked there in Engine 81 for two seasons. And then uh, 20. The 2018 to 2020, I uh, got a position with the Klamath National Forest on Engine 378, Grass Lake Station. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the the stuff that happened after that a bit more public, but uh, I'm, I'm still in fire. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm just back back in the private sector. Back in the private sector. So you're back to the contract world um, for obvious reasons. Right. Okay. So now... Let's get into the story about what's going on and the lawsuit and how you won your case and the whole encompassing thing about fear of reprisal and doing what's right, man, because this is heavy and you're all over the news right now. I know Wildfire Today did a uh, story on you. I know that NBC did a new uh, a story on you and a couple of other podcasts in the fire world did it as well. Uh, they didn't do an audio episode as I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with, but uh, I know they've written about it in their blogs. So. Let's take it away, man. Let's let's go from beginning to end and how this whole cluster went down. Okay, if you want to go back to the nucleus of, of how kind of this all got to this level, uh, I, I think it, personally, I think it really starts back in on this, I think it was March 2019. Uh, my my son, who was uh, uh, he was three years old at the time, uh, he he came down with with with, with a cold and. Um, we hadn't, we hadn't really noticed anything about him having any issues having colds before, but, uh, th this, uh, that time 2019, he, he got really sick and my wife was getting pretty concerned. 
So we took him down to uh, Mercy Medical in Mount Shasta. And we lived in Weed, California uh, during all this time. And uh, his, his breathing, breathing was getting really, really bad. It was super labored. So the doctor recommended that he be life flighted to UC Davis, uh, which is in Sacramento, um, or the Sacramento area. And uh, it, his, his breathing got really bad. They were able to get it a, a little bit under, under control. And it was better, from what I understand, that during the flight. I didn't go during the flight. My uh, my wife went. The reason I didn't go is because I was doing uh, training stuff with fire. And being that I'm the breadwinner, it was a difficult decision, but I kind of had to stay behind. But I, I trusted her um, to have the best interest. Um, so once he was there, um, uh, apparently, and I, I have this document. This is actually part of the case. Um, the, the doctor who examined him at UC Davis uh, said that he was so acutely critical. He was more acutely critical than their more their most severe uh, child patient in their in, the, in their ICU. So he was doing pretty, pretty, pretty badly. Um, so he ended up staying in uh, UC Davis ICU for uh, two days and was uh, discharged from ICU, but still in hospital for another day. And uh, it, it, was, it was he had a super bad uh, asthma attack. Um, that's when he was diagnosed with an a autoimmune disorder. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, that was always an extra thing to worry about uh, since then. And then, of course, the, the following year, you've got COVID um, hitting the U.S. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm real concerned as a parent because, you know, my, my son and, uh, you know, they're all, you know, COVID's the next plague. You're, you know, COVID just a flu. And for, from my perspective, you know, even best case scenario, say COVID was just, just a flu. My mentality at that time, um, my kid almost died from from just a regular cold. So yeah. what's flu going to do to him? So I was super uh, concerned, super cautious. I had a lot, had a lot of questions, had a lot of concerns. Um, and I believe it was in uh, March, late March or early April. Uh, I had come on as a seasonal, and uh, the the forest. I had been bringing uh, management uh, across the district um, from station to station to get everybody's input about about their concerns with COVID and any ideas what they could do to to mitigate once we once we're once we're on fire assignment and we come back to, to quarantine and there, there were a lot of ideas thrown thrown around um, but the the overall feel that I got from those meetings is that okay they're, they're obviously really concerned they're sending management out to um, in, in, in interview a station by station. So obviously that they're, 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 work, they're working on the plan. And this was in, you know, uh, late March or late, early April, like I said. So, so right at like that, that first wave, that first peak, basically. Yeah. Pretty much when everything was starting to get shut down. Yeah. The like, defecation was hitting the yeah. oscillation. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, 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 that built my confidence that okay, management is is, is on is on the ball. They're they're going to be they're going to be working on something. Mm-hmm. And um, so then then we we got our first fire dispatch. And I think it if I remember correctly, it was, it was on the fourth of July, and um, we didn't know exactly where we were going to. And as, as usual, when you go fire assignment, you know exactly where you're going to. Um, we just knew we were going south now, and then. Uh, once we went southbound, we found out we were going to, to Southern California, um, which r- right right then, you know, I, I knew right away it was a hot spot. These are things I'm paying attention to. It was kind of anticipated we were going to go down south because we were next on rotation. And obviously there, there were fires going on over there. So we figured we would probably be doing a fire suppression or covering stations. And so we, we, we get down there and um, the... First thing that happens is what we're engaging in fire that evening, and it's just you know, a standard thing. You know, you, you you get out there, you're you're on fire the first day. Um, you're suppressing uh, that these were uh, fireworks that started uh, these fires, so that they were relatively small. Uh, luckily, the sun was going down, so the RHs were kind of kicking up a little bit, and it wasn't a big deal to put them out. We ended up getting off shift about uh, uh, eleven o'clock or so that that evening, and then the, the next day. We went to uh, to our first uh, morning briefing, and this ended up being at, at, at a station. It wasn't just any station. The station was recently uh, um, shut down and quarantined and cleaned because people had come down with COVID there. And uh, 
the, 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 just that alone, there was a lot of concern amongst the strike team. Um, you know, why, why, why are we coming here? How, how come we can't be at the host station instead of coming to an actual station that, that came down with COVID? And so I, I think that a little bit of uh, questioning about that brought us to a different station uh, towards the middle of the day. Uh, it's kind of weird because that station too it had just been shut down and quarantined and cleaned because people had come down with COVID. Uh, I, from my, my understanding, it was a couple of days to a couple of weeks before uh, we showed up. So I, I don't know which one was a couple of days and which one was a couple of weeks. Did it really but, give you a um, clear like indication of what was what basically? Yeah, it was, it was really vague. It was like, yeah, well, one of these stations was a couple of days ago. It came down, uh, somebody came down with COVID and one station was a couple of weeks ago. We can't, we, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, I don't want to say they didn't want to tell us, but it wasn't made clear which ones were which. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just among the, the strike team, there was, there was a lot of concern. Um, and so the um, next few days, we were... Uh, Putting out more, more fires out there. Um, some of the fires that had already pretty much dead out, we were just gritting it because uh, it was right next to the highway. So we were just making it look good. And kind of what the public doesn't know, you know, you're out, you're out there to make uh, to make the public feel safe rather than actually doing it. And any, anything of value, this yeah. fire was clearly dead out. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so after a few days of that, I think we're only down there for about four days in total. And uh, on the, on that last day we were there, um, our strike team leader trainee came up and told us that we're uh, going to be released tomorrow and, and we're going home. And I was like, well, what, what, what do you mean we're going home? We're, we're, we're going to get quarantined or something on the way. And uh, I'm like, no, we're just going to go home. And right, right, right then and there, I'm like, what the fuck? What do you mean? That doesn't make any sense. We're going to go home. This, uh, the management just a month or two ago was you know, ha- having these meetings with us, telling us that they were working on something. Uh, they're, 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 they were taking ideas from uh, people in, in these uh, meetings and they really made it clear that, that, that they were working on something. Um, so it, it, I, I know a lot of it's uh, centered on me with uh, kind of going against it, but the, uh, I'd, say, I'd say the vast majority of Strike Team 3600 was concerned about just going home like that. Yeah, just all of a sudden, you know, like you know, something's up, basically. Right. Yeah. And uh, so we we had we had voiced our concerns. Uh, I I believe the strike team trainee went to the strike team actual for a little guidance. And uh, once uh, we we got word again from the actual uh, strike team actual, he came back and said, uh, "Appling is standing his ground." Mike Appling, the core staff officer, and. Uh, once, once I had heard that, um, I was well, shit. I have to think of something. I got to think of something quick. Um, so that 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 evening, we, we bedded down for the night in the hotel, and I pretty much stayed up for a good four hours. Um, we probably ended up going to bed about one, one, one or two a.m. But um, my goal was to make a letter as a as, as, as poignant as, as possible about uh, us coming back from a COVID hot zone. Um, per- personally, I, I, I didn't. I thought if I made it about my kid, a lot of people wouldn't really care. So I kind of I made it more about the community and the uh, um, Siski County is an older community, so there's a lot of elders that, that, that live there. Yeah, so and made, made, made it about that. And don't think about my family. Think about your family. Yeah, that's another um, thing too. Is uh, Sisu County? I mean, that's it, it's small communities. It's not like they have like the uh, the resources like say Reno does per se. You know, we right. we have hospitals and shit, and we we have the access to healthcare in case it's like a severe case of COVID that you track mm-hmm. back. You guys not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, for for, for to a large degree, yeah, um, yeah, it would be easy for Wairika Hospital to get to get overwhelmed, um, or even Mercy Medical in, in, in Shasta. There's just not much out there. Yeah. But uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, anyway, um, as I was writing this letter, uh, or, or this um, letter that I planned to post on, uh, I think it was Siskiyou County uh, COVID uh, awareness. Their their name changed, but at the time it was, some, it was something about the specifically about COVID. Um, I, I I made it a point. I, I knew we were coming on the clock. Which I believe it was uh, 0700. I I wanted to post it 
or early in the morning so people would see it, but I wanted to make sure I was off the clock when, when I did it. It just me being an armchair lawyer. It's like, uh, well, I did it off the clock. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, everybody's entitled so, uh, to the First Amendment. First right, Amendment yeah. rights, man. That's it. I mean, but you're on. Speech, I'm, not, I'm not on the clock. I can do whatever I want. Yep. Um, so I, I, I posted it at about 6.50 a.m. And uh, it, that, that was pretty much it. I, I, I had left it at that. And like, shit, we're, we're probably going home. I have to think of something. And then I, I, and at that time, I was already thinking, well, I, I could probably set up my tent, and, uh, stay out, stay outside. Um, the, the, the weather's warm enough. I could probably you know, take cold showers out there with a hose. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of brainstorming what, what, what I could do um, to just kind of stay, keep myself quarantined from, uh, from my kid. And uh, so about the eight, eight, eight o'clock, maybe 830, we're at the, the, a, a makeshift uh, I, ICP wasn't necessarily real I, ICP. They just had uh, lunches and you could grab uh, um, so just, just stuff, stuff you need for it throughout the day, but it wasn't like a, a dedicated uh, I, ICP. It was kind um, of just like a makeshift kind of camp, basically. Yeah, because at, at that point, uh, Forest Service, I think they were trying not to put in a full fledged ICP because of the distancing that they wanted to do. Yeah. So yeah, in, in SoCal, um, it was weird. It was, it was an ICP, but it wasn't an ICP. Um, yeah. So I, anyway, we, we all get there with the strike team, and then about eight thirty or so, um, start getting some some rumblings of uh, something on, on social media, and uh, I, I forget. I think it was my captain came up to me and was like, "Hey, Pedro, did you post something on, on social media?" And uh, I was like, yeah, I, I, I posted about us coming back without any uh, COVID uh, protocols, any isolation. And then uh, he, he, he went away. And then uh, the uh, uh, strike team leader came, came, up, came up to me. And uh, there, there was nothing disrespectful about our interaction. I remember exactly what, what was said. Because um, the, the strike team leader, actual, he, he was my um, main captain on engine. Uh, 378 from the time I was on, on climate. Mm-hmm. It was just uh, this time he, he also had uh, strike team actual quals and could train a strike team training. Uh, so the um, captain for 378 that I was with was actually um, the FDO, but he, was, he had the captain qual so he could be captain. Um, so yeah, there, there, there was some back and forth conversation, a brief conversation with me and some of the, the, the leaders. And then uh, you know, we, we were just told to load up and start heading north. And so um, after one, one or two stops going northbound, uh, we ended up pulling over and then pulled over again. And it, it was obvious why we were pulling over. I, I, I believe even then that the, the post was bringing a lot of blowback to, to management. And then uh, I, I think it was by the time we got to Bakersfield, a decision was made to uh, make it to Sacramento and bed bed down for the night. Um, I, I, I think we could have made it all the way to Arica in that single day, but I think there was they were trying to formulate some some other plans for, for quarantine, which we, we we didn't know at the time. It was just me thinking what that they were possibly thinking. Um, so we ended up bedding down in Sac- Sacramento, and during that uh, stay in Sacramento that evening, me and the strike team actual. Talked to the uh, 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 district management, Drew Stroberg and uh, Phil Borderland, uh, over, over over the phone. And uh, so my, my captain uh, was striking actual. He was already aware of my uh, issue, the, the life flight that I had with my son the, the year before, my, my concerns. Yeah, this is like so an extremely had, hazardous situation for your son. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he, he had already made that pretty uh, clear with the management, my, my concerns and, and why I possibly did what, what, what I did. Um, so when I, when I talked to uh, Stroberg and Bill Borderland, um, they, they, were, they were asking me, like, why, why, why did you do it? Um, why, why, why did you go about it that way? And I was like, well, you know, we, we, we had voiced our concerns to the strike team leader and the strike team leader said, after the standing his ground, um, obviously my, uh, Captain Strike Team Actual told you about uh, the issue that I have I had with my son last year and my continued concerns with it. So I was I was expecting uh, some some kind of uh, isolation protocol, especially with uh, with the uh, meetings that we had 
that, that you guys did earlier in, in, in the year um, saying that, that, that you're working on something. And uh, I mean, Str Strober, uh, he was just like, uh, I, I don't know what's, what's going to happen with, with you, Pedro. Uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, this was very unprofessional. And uh, in I mean, my, my opinion. Mentality, what's that? In my opinion. Yeah, there, there, there was a lot of, in my opinion, was, you'll see a lot of that in uh, more, more documents. Yeah, I'm actually um, reading through your uh, verdict uh, right now. Okay. And so I'm mm -hmm. trying to find out what, I'm trying to look up some like USC codes right now. So, but keep going. I'm trying to like figure out what, what you were protected under. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Sorry, man. No, no, you're, you're fine. Uh, so yeah, as I, as I was having this uh, phone conversation, I would just, I, I, I was, I was answering the questions, but I was also staying quiet because I was pretty disappointed with, with management and their, 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 their handling of, of, of COVID mitigation. Um, it was uh, not fun. Um, I, I was I was told a couple of times by the captain in, in the engine that like, you probably don't have a job anymore after this. And uh, I mean, I, I, that that that's a pretty stressful thing to go through. But I mean, what what, what, am, what, what am I going to do? Am I going to kiss management's ass or protect my kid? And it's, it's a pretty pretty easy choice for me, even though the outcome wouldn't, wouldn't have been fun either way. I get it, man. Um, and once you start having kids, man, I just, I mean, I have one on the way right now. He's Ju doing June 12th or no, sorry, June 10th. And then, uh, I have a one-year-old as well. And, no, no, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, dude, it changes your life dramatically when you have kids. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, if, uh, if, if I didn't have a kid and we were coming back from, from Southern California, I probably would have been annoyed and pissed off like it, like most of the other strike team was, but at the end of the day, I, I probably would just shut my mouth and been disappointed with management like everybody usually is. Yeah. But because they, because my concern extended to my son, it was like, we, we kind of leave me no choice. I kind of have to be a good parent now and do, do, do what I can. I mean, at, at this point, you're, you're, my, you're, you're not, you're not management anymore. You're my enemy. So I, I have to do what, what, I, what I have to do to, uh, to make, keep, keep my son safe. And if that means not having a job, then I guess okay. I guess I'll find a job somewhere else. Uh, so yeah, I mean, after that long conversation, it was a good thirty minutes. We were, we were on the phone with them. Um, we, we bedded down for the rest of the night in Sacramento, and we were coming back up uh, north to, to Wairika. And I think we got to Wairika about nine or ten, 10 or eleven in, in the morning. We left pretty early the next day. Um, and you, you, you know, when, when you come back as a strike team, usually um, engines will pair off and go to their own district. It's, it's just faster that way as we're on the highway. Yeah. But we were told to, to, to stay together and go to the Wairika shipyard. And so we knew there's some, something going on. Um, and what, once we got there uh, after a little bit, uh, Mike Appling fire staff officer showed up and he was actually surprisingly super apologetic about, uh, everything. Um, and he, he basically he, he he called us guinea pigs, um, which ne never never sit with me the, the right way. I'm, I'm sure if you talk to anybody else that was on that the 13 they'll verify for sure. Like yeah, he called us guinea pigs, <laughs> and it's, especially the uh, strike team actual. He, he was there for the whole thing. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I I can understand management's perspective. Like yeah, COVID is kind of an unprecedented thing. I haven't really had a national or worldwide play like like this since the spanish flu but i mean come on you guys were sent, sending emails you guys were coming out to districts um get, getting getting people's feedback and then you had nothing in place well they also had national direction as far as how they were supposed to handle it i mean it was all kind of boiled down to the individual district level during that whole pandemic but still we right. had, yeah, see, an the, outline. We had the, an outline right yeah, I mean the, the the way that document you're talking about what was worded, um, a lot of gray it, area. It, yeah, it gave a lot of broad discretion to uh, to, to Forrest. So I mean, they, they could basically not do anything, and you know, nothing's going to happen though. So I mean, and I, I think Climate National Forest Management took them a challenge on that because they did nothing. <laughs> um, so anyway, after this long. Uh, Feel by uh, Appling, uh, come to find out he's going to keep us together as a strike team, and we're going to go. We're going to uh, be on patrol throughout the west side of the district, so uh, Oakville District and uh, Scott Salmon District. 
Um, and we, we ended up doing that for a good uh, six or seven days. Um, and I think that six or seven days was because uh, once you, once we were away from the hot zone, those days we were out of the hot zone driving back counted as a uh, quarantine days because at that time in July, 2020, it was eight days before you started showing any uh, COVID symptoms. So I, I think the goal was to get to that eight days. To see if anybody see, pops hot. Yeah, see if, see if anybody starts having symptoms. Um, and so after that eight days, um, no, nobody was showing symptoms. So uh, Apple broke up the crew and we, we went our way. And I hadn't heard anything back from, uh, from, from management until the 14th of July in an email from Drew Strober. And uh, this is in the documents as well. I don't have I don't have it on me, uh, so I can't quote verbatim. But um, Strober basically takes responsibility for uh, finalizing that he determined I I, I did no wrongdoing. Um, but in his opinion, again, um, he find he found the way I went about it unprofessional. Uh, he accused me of not going up the chain of command which is bullshit. Went up the chain of command a couple times. And even the way the uh, uh, court and the, the, the whistleblower uh, act works, I didn't have to go up the chain of command. I, I, I could have posted whatever I wanted to on social media. Yep. So actually going protected. up the chain of command, what's that? You're completely protected under the whistleblower act. Yeah. Uh, be, be, yeah. Being the way that the whistleblower act is worded, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have to do a damn thing going up the chain of command. Um, but I didn't. Um, but th- th- there was this prevailing thing for a long time. And I think even after the, year of initially reporting I was fired for a whistleblower or fired for posting on social media was oh you should have went up the chain of command you know that, that was the number one complaint for people who, who, who were against me that uh, was uh, you need to go up the chain of command the chain of command was met several times over and I didn't have to go up the chain of command um so that, that, that was, that's really awesome to be uh vindicated in that part too um so after that uh, that whole whistleblower thing happened um, I get the July 14th email from Drew Stroger. Um, I, I, I thought things had gone back to normal, but there was a new element that I didn't notice about myself and that I was super pissed off, uh, really negative. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty sarcastic person by nature, but I, I, guess I think that's kind of going, all of us though. I mean, we're all kind of like cynics and it's like, it's like a defense mechanism of, or a coping skill almost. It's kind yeah, of like I, inherent I, I, with the I culture. Think for, 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 I think for Wildland Fire, you, you, you kind of need that attitude. You kind of have to be a smart ass and uh, kind of be the kind of person that uh, it has kind of a dark sense of humor, and dark, a little bit of a dark attitude. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, like, like I said, this was uh, a, a, a few weeks that I, I apparently I was just being very, very negative. Uh, things that I weren't saying. I was constantly dogging on, on management, apparently more than usual. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, my, my captain at, at the time, not the striking actual, he was, he was, he had a lot. Of, my, my captain was pretty qualified. He wore a lot of hats. And most of the season, he was a, a battalion chief for, uh, the, the goose nest district ranger because the other battalion chief had left for a different job. Um, so my captain was, a uh, uh, the different captain who is normally the FBO. Um, I, I don't have anything, I guess the guy's a great guy, I follow him to inquire, but uh, my, the, that captain had come up to me and said that my uh, attitude is affecting the morale of uh, the, the crew. And that kind of took me back. And uh, I was, I, I, I apologized to him. And I, you know, uh, yeah, after the whole, whole COVID thing, I, I guess I was. Pretty pretty bitter about how management hand, handled things, but I'll, I'll I'll do I'll do what I can to to improve. Um, and that, that was that was basically it. There wasn't any disrespectful back and forth. It was kind of an understanding. It wasn't like and insubordination I, or any like terminable offense, right? No, he was he was, he was just giving me the standard verbal warning. But the, it was it was it was it was very respectful. There was no, there was no bad bad uh, uh, back and forth or, or, or anything. And um, so. Um, Around this time, I uh, get offers to start going with a crew called Crew 71. 
and Crew 7-1 was extremely short-staffed. They only had about uh, seven people, uh, crew boss, and six uh, firefighter twos. None of them had any wildlife fire experience whatsoever. Um, so if, if they wanted to go on, on, on any fires, um, district management wanted someone to supervise, supervise, have a second supervisor instead of just crew boss. Um, so I, I I was reluctant because the uh, um, crew boss, um, Mario Alvarez, he's, he was someone that I had always had a bad reputation. But when I was working on the last national force, he was an uh, engine boss. And no, no, nobody liked him. Uh, everybody always said he had, he had a bad attitude and uh, was not an easy guy to work with. And uh, so w- when I went to the climate financial course, I found out he was a crew boss for seven uh, one. And uh, I, I, I had even turned down training assignments to go on, on his crew just, be, just because of his, his, his reputation. And from what, what I, I had only been around him when he was around his, his crew once, and I was at the station. And uh, the, the crews were, were washing the rigs, and uh, he was getting out a clear glove and wiping the um, hood of the trucks to see if there was any dirt on it. And if there was, it made me clean the trucks again. And what, when, when, I, when I saw that, I'm, okay, I'm, I made a good call, never, never going with this guy. I'm not, not going to deal with that kind of bullshit because that, that wouldn't fly with me at all. Um, but there, there, there was a, a bit of pressure on management for me to go with the uh, crew seven one, and they they, they kind of pulled at my uh, heartstrings a little bit because they were telling me these guys are seasonals like you. Um, if you don't go with them, there's nobody else to go with them, so they can't get on any fires. Uh, your, your qualifications can give them uh, fire assignments. So I was like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll go. I'll go ahead and go with them. Yeah. And um, so we ended up doing. One day on uh, the 2019 lava fire, there's a lava fire in 2020. That's not the same one. Uh, there's a lava fire in 2019, and it, it, it was a, a an underburn that kind of went into a lava rock. So it wasn't we were going to put the, this fire out. You just had to keep eyes on it. Just so check I, it out every time it kind of like pops up. Yeah, one of those fires. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we were basically just watching it to uh, keep an eye out to make sure it didn't go towards Doris, which is a little town in that in that area. And uh, so we, we we monitored it all, all day. Um, didn't have I didn't have any issue with, with Mario, um, and that, that that was the end of it. And uh, a few days later, I ended up going back with him on a uh, with Crew Seven One on a fire called the Cherry Fire, and it, it was pretty much the, the same thing. It, we, we it was it was it was basically an almost dead fire. There, there was some activity on it, but. It was probably good for firefighter twos to, to be on because they can kind of get a feel for what you know continuous fire line looks like, what it should look like. Um, we good were doing like fire. A, yeah, yeah, good, good entry in fire, and we were getting our fifty to hundred foot depth. It was like it was a thirty three acre fire. Um, he took one flank with some people. I took another flank with, with a couple other people, and uh, it, was, it was it was a good day. Um, I didn't really have any interaction with, with the crew boss that day because we were able to go two different flanks. And uh, we were expecting to stay for a couple of days, but that ended up just being a one-day gig. Um, the the big uh, fire that I was on that kind of shit hit the fan was about a week later. We went to this fire called the Little Soda Fire, about 600 acres, and th- th- this was the first active fire for, for these firefighter twos. Um, at, at that point, uh, I was, just getting, just going with them on the little soda fire took more coaxing because I, I was pissed off that management kept coming to me um, to go with Crew Seven One because one they had a, um, a, tr- a patrol people who were you know uh, they, they were GS five GS six qualified you know how, how about you keep them and have them have them go with uh, Crew Seven One instead of letting them go out on fire assignments you know just driving around. Um, yeah, at, at that, I, I was also a bit bitter because at that point I was six seasons in the four service. I applied for over 300 positions. I was, uh, IC five qualified and yet here I'm, I'm still a seasonal GS four. It's like, you know, why, why are you not hiring me permanently at, at least as a GS four so I can get my GS five, GS six uh, at some point. But, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, there, there was frustrations coming from, for me on, on that front as well. It's kind of like that snowball um, effect, basically. It's just like all this shit's kind of piling up. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And so um, my uh, um, the, the strike team actual slash captain slash battalion, he, he, he called me as a battalion uh, and kind of, kind of said to me, if, if you go with Crew 7-1, I'll, I'll look at it as a personal favor to you. And when he said that, I was like, "You don't, you don't have to do that." And this guy, I mean, he he's, he signed off a couple of my task books. He's given me plenty of opportunities. If if anything, he's the last person in fire that owes me anything. So I told him I'll I'll, I'll go on Crew Seven One, um, but he did assure me that that was the last time I was going to go on Crew Seven One. So with, with that in mind, I I, I went with uh, Crew Seven One to the, the little soda fire, and uh, the, the the few days we were on on the little soda fire. Um, that first day, I, I, I could tell uh, the new guys they were uh, ha- having having a rough time because it, it it was that it's that part of the uh, west side of the planet that's infamous. You know, steep terrain. It's a uh, you know steep steep foliage. You know, some point you take one step forward, you go two steps back just because you're slipping so much. Yeah, you need to tie and, a uh, cord around like trees or not pee cord, but uh, like pee hose around trees just to shimmy up the damn things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, both in, in some cases. Yeah, whatever you can do to get up the hill uh, sometimes. And uh, yeah, so I mean, these were, were new guys. Um, some of them were, were having a hard time. Uh, you, you could definitely tell who, who was in shape and who was out of shape. Uh, but one thing that bothered me, um, I didn't say anything because, like I said, I wanted to keep things kosher, um, was that the uh, crew boss Mario, he was going way, way ahead of the slower guys. And the way I was trained when I was on the hand crew is you're only as fast as the slowest person. Oh, 100%. So you should always go as, as, as a crew. Don't leave your slower people behind. Well, there's also a different pace with like a PT hike. And that's when you're like yeah. hauling ass. And there's right. the fire pace where you're, you know, moving with a purpose, but you're not like dragging ass or trying to push yourself way too mm-hmm. hard up the hill. So you're spent at the top. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, so uh, Mario and, and the good hikers, they were going way ahead and I was... I, I had a couple of stragglers in, in, in the back. Um, and I, I was putting zero, zero pressure on him because I, I know, especially being a new firefighter, one guy, he was from Oklahoma. So he'd never seen a mountain before he came to California, you know? So uh, um, I, I, I just kept telling him, hey, you guys go go at your own pace. The bus side of the planet is no joke. If you guys need to slow down or even stop, do what you have to do to get yourself up that hill as safely as possible. Um, I, I was telling you know we're we're, all, we're only a six seven man module. You know, if this fire g- gets out of control, there's nothing we're gonna be able to do to contain it. Um, especially with the lack of experience we, we have we have on the crew. So you guys just do what you have to do to, to, to get up there safely. Don't worry about speed. And so uh, eventually we get up there, and uh, they, these guys see see fire for the first time, and yeah, it's it's it's, it's ripping pretty good. Not the, the super concerning fire, but if if, if you're new to fire. That's probably pretty damn intimidating for you. Oh yeah. Well, this is a new crew with little experience and it's late July on the Klamath. It's what is it? July yeah. 28th is what you're uh, yeah. saying. There. Yeah. That, yeah. That sounds right. Document saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So uh, anyway, uh, when, when we got there, um, there was actually a shot crew uh, ahead of us so that they were putting in uh, the, the line for the uh, East flank. And basically what we were doing was cleaning up their, their East flank. Um, so they could progress faster. And uh, there, there was a couple of spots that we cleaned up a little bit better. There was super duffy, some spot for several feet of uh, just straight duff. And, uh, but yeah, we, we, were, we were doing what we can to you know, um, keep, keep, keep the line good and the shots were doing what shots do. And uh, yeah, we were basically just doing our best to hold, hold the back door with the experience that, that we had. Um, but yeah, it, it was an opening experience for it. For, for these new new guys, I and mean, there were trees falling below interior, and they, they, they were freaking out. And uh, I, I I could I totally understand that. I remember my, my first season, like the first time I heard a tree fall. Like, what the fuck did I just sign up for? Dude, to this uh, day, if I hear like you know that sound like hinge or like Hingewood makes, like, or like you have like a I don't know a comment. Right, that's like a crackling. Snag. Yeah, that's or that uh, like a snag that's blown in the wind and it makes that like creaking sound. Dude, right, that shit yeah. still gets like hairs up my down my spine. Dude, I'm like, oh. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, so on, on, on this fire, um, like I said, it, it was super steep. Um, at, at this point, it's getting so steep that there's there's no we don't we're not worried worried about the foliage anymore. It's just the the ground is so smooth and so steep that that same thing one step forward, two steps back, and we're using our tools to try and hoist this up and uh, clear clear up what we can in the meantime. 
But anyway, I, I don't know if I'm running too long with this, but what long song story yeah, short. Time in the world, dude. Okay. Um, um, but, but it, was, it, was, it was a good experience for, for rookie firefighters, for, for sure. Um, they really gave them a good idea how, how heavy and how hard and heavy it can get out there. Um, we were uh, out there for, for the whole day. I think mean, by the time we started leaving the, that fire line, it was probably about 10 or 11 o'clock at, at night. And uh, so this is everyone's first time, nighttime walk out on, on the fire line. And uh, now I was starting to hear some complaints about how people's legs were hurting and the Sawyer was complaining about how his shoulder was hurting. And, uh, and so I, I, I was taking all these, I was, I was pretty much no, noting everything you could tell them. Day one, crew was hurting. Um, but anyway, we eventually get back down to the bridge and we stay at this uh, nice little campsite and we could bed down for the night. And uh, that first night, I'm already hearing people talking about their their, their legs and their thighs cramping. Um, didn't seem like it was major, but uh, you know what, what, when it happened, so some of the guys were laughing about it, and I understand laughing about it, um, especially if you're not familiar with what that means. But that first day, the, I, it was clear to me that okay, some guys are um, being or are, are dehydrated. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was just telling everybody, if, if you guys get leg cramps, even if you're not pound as much water as you can. Um, uh, keep keep a bottle of water next to your bed. Wake up, wake up middle of the night. Take a nice good swig in the morning. Drink pound a whole another bottle of water before you before your day starts. Um, a little, was that half and half Gatorade and water? That's always a good one too. Yeah, yeah, half and half. Um, but yeah, uh, there, there, there was there was no issue drinking Gatorade. They were, they were drinking their Gatorade with the water. Well, it's like new firefighters. It's always always the, the Gatorade. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there, there was a kid. Back in 2008, all he had in his backpack was, was Yuhu, and his, the crew boss is like, "What the fuck? You, why do you have fucking Yuhu in your in your line gear?" And the guy is like, "It's not chocolate." And so, uh, no, the uh, he's like, "Why do you have fucking chocolate milk in your line gear?" Like, it's not chocolate milk; it's Yuhu. <laughs> oh Jesus! And like, he, he didn't he didn't last too too long after that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, coming coming back to to this uh, little soda fire. Uh, day two, um, everybody's obviously a little, little hurt. Um, they've done on fire like this before. I mean, even me, I, I was probably three or four years removed from the anchor. It was kicking my ass a little bit, especially the, the hike up. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody was, was uh, hiking a little bit slower. You can tell some people were hurting already just on the beginning of day two. Um, so my, my, my concern was you know, obviously you want to keep them busy so they can secure what line you can, but you also want to make sure you're not over exerting them. Yeah. You can't um, break them off. Like first thing in the morning, man. I mean, they're ineffective yeah, all day it, or it, even it, worse. It, it, they go probably, down. Yeah, absolutely. And it's probably a good, it, it feels like a mile, mile and a half hike up, but just the steepness, it probably was only half mile to, to, to get there. Um, but yeah, once, once, once we got there, we were on the same piece of ground. We just had to hold it and improve what was, what was there. And uh, again, we were split. Uh, Mario had taken the top half of the um, fire fire line. I was on the bottom to the middle of the fire line, and that's where, where we were meeting throughout the day. Um, and uh, so, for, as, as far as the east west flank flank break, uh, Elephant Head had showed up later that day, twenty man hand crew out of Utah, and they took that uh, west side. And uh, yeah, so for, for for that west rest of the day, we were on that. Uh, east side flank and uh that late afternoon um there was some guys on on mario's flank on mario's crew who had come down to our flank uh to drop off some some hose packs they're starting to get their uh hose line down and uh i i, I had looked at looked at these guys and i they, they, they were pretty tired you know um I, I had noticed this one guy. I'm, I'm terrible with names. I, I forget some of these guys' names. But this this one dude, he 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 looked like he was in good shape, like hot shot shape, great great physique. He looked like he he, he he could definitely he was a runner in great shape. But he he was shaking. He was no, notably shaking. And the first thing I asked him when I noticed that I was like, "Hey, have you taken the lunch today?" And I was he he said no. And I was like, "Put put your pack down. Grab some food. Drink drink some water. Take a break." And um, as, so I, I asked him, there, there was another guy uh, with them who wasn't doing quite as bad, but I told him to take a break too. But I had asked him, 
has Mario given you guys any breaks? And they're like, no, he hasn't given us anything. And I'm like, yeah, just sit there for a good 10, 15 minutes, uh, pound, pound a bunch of water. Um, not too much water. You want to kind of conserve a little bit, but pound, pound a decent amount. Um, make sure, make sure, make sure you're fucking eating. Like, uh, you know, make sure you have some snacks. Don't open your MRE. Uh, that we were eating the MREs. Um, to make sure you're you're eating throughout the day. Even if it's just you know, open up your MRE and you got M and M's. Put that M and M in your pocket and just snack on it th- throughout the day. And once that's empty, go on your MRE and grab another snack and put it. Just keep something at, at the ready. Don't go all day without eating. Yeah, well, it's like these new guys and new girls that are on the crew, man. They haven't been seasoned to like learn how to eat on the go and keep it going like snacking all day either. So, I mean, it's not like anybody tells you that shit. You kind of got to figure it out or, you know, I mean, I, I, personally, I would think the crew boss would tell them that shit, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's those hard lessons learned, you know, until you like actually figure it out. Um, so yeah, the, the, the rest, the rest of the day, it, it ends up being pretty standard. What, what, what you'd expect. I mean, we're starting to put the hose laid down. People are hiking out with more hose. Um, we, we end up getting off the fire at a decent time, probably 8 p.m. And we're, we're hiking out and we're going back to the same camp we were before. And day two, um, more guys are complaining about the leg cramps. And he, even me, at the end of that second day, I was doing some little bit of uh, cramps in the back, back of my thighs and my butt. I, I drink more water. Um, so, yeah, that, that evening happens. And then the, the next day, we go back up. Um, as, as as we're lining out um, throughout that morning, I, I I hadn't heard that there was a, any issues with any uh, guys talking about uh, uh, throw, throwing up or anything serious at, at that point. So and, and it was my assumption that we were all good to go. And as soon as we start hiking back up that hill, um, the guy who ended up going down for rabdo, I, I noticed he was uh, going super slow and he, he was shaking quite a bit. And uh, once he started using his tool as a, a walking stick, I, I, he, he looked even worse, like he was about to fall over. And I asked him, if every time you take a step, do you feel like you're about to fall over? And he said, yeah. So I immediately told him to um, put his pack down, put his tool down, um, open up your shirt, uh, start drinking some water. Um, I, I, I suspected Rabdo pretty much right, right, right away. Um, uh, after that, I call uh, Mario over the radio, and it probably took about five or six uh, calls for him to answer. Um, I, I was assuming because of where we were in relation to where he was. Yeah, it was um, just like a dead maybe, zone or something. Yeah, I mean, that, it got a little steep, and there was a little hole that he couldn't hear us. Um, but it, it, it turns out in the court documents, uh, one of the guys who testified for me who was on Crew 71, Mario w- w- was ignoring his, his radio calls. Um, but uh, yeah, after a while, I ended up getting a hold of Mario, and uh, we, we initiated a, a medical response for the, the patient that went down, and uh, he ended up being uh, taken to uh, Warwick Hospital, where he was officially diagnosed with rhabdo. Um, but it, it, it was it was crazy seeing him uh, change so fast. So he, he went from shaking to uh, sweating to, to not sweating, and his skin went a couple shades lighter. Little pale. Um, yeah. Yep. And uh, I, I, I was telling him to drink water, but I, I, even then, I knew you, your body can only drink so much water, absorb it so so much. I mean, he really needed to be uh, evac out, out of there. Um, but yeah, um, we ended up we ended up safely safely getting him to very slowly walk down the fire line, and uh, eventually we got in our vehicle, drove back, and he was medevaced out to our recall hospital. He was in ICU for. Uh, I think two or three days and he was discharged. And from my understanding, he went back for another two days in, in ICU for uh, uh, his rhabdo or just the damage from the rhabdo, his insides was uh, forced him to go back to ICU essentially. Yeah. Rhabdo is no um, joke, man. It'll, it will kill you. Absolutely. It yeah. Will I mean, kill it's been you. documented. It has before. Yep. Um, but yeah, so um, that, that evening he was taken to, uh, to the hospital uh, we, we we had an, an AAR, and in that AAR, I mean, from what I had talked to with my uh, the battalion chief, I knew that was going to be my last role was with Crew Seven One, so I thought it was real important to kind of talk about the elephant in the room, which was um, 
the, the guys Lomario had taken had went to visit the patient in Wairika, the guys were telling me, yeah, tr- uh, I almost said his name. Um, the patient had uh, thrown don't say, up. Don't say no. his name. <laughs> don't yeah, say yeah, I try not to. Name. <laughs> the uh, patient had uh, threw up, thrown up about five times before we went on that hike. I was like, what? what, what how, that wasn't how reported. Up? I mean, what's that? That wasn't made known to everybody else. No, that wasn't no, no, nobody. I, I didn't know about it. I don't. I don't know if, if Mario knew about it. I know Mario knew about the last time he threw up, which was in his vehicle on the way over to the fire. I don't know if, if Mario knew the other times he had thrown up. Um, it wouldn't put it past me that Mario did know, know about that, just knowing how little he cares about his his crew members. Um, Mario, unfortunately, he's uh, he, there. There have been several incidences where. Um, they, they, they've gone off on forest assignment and then it turns out somebody has gone down for dehydration and come back um, to the forest and, 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 they're su- and they're suddenly on light duty for a long period of time. So um, I, I, I think it's pretty well documented that Mario has a history of uh, people going down on his crew. I think the thing is that uh, it hasn't been directly attributed to his lack of uh, safety. Um, so yeah, once 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 all that information was made available to me, I thought it was real important that I bring that up to Mario, and I basically just told Mario um, again, trying trying to be respectful, even I know I don't have I don't really care for him, and I know it's gonna be our last interaction. I just want to try and stay kosher. Um, I, I I told him essentially something along the lines of uh, Travis threw up uh, a bunch of times, and I heard you were, you were aware, aware of one of them. Um, if that happens, you know, that's, uh, he, he's dehydrated. So we, it, we should reassess before we hiked up the hill in the first place. Um, and Mario, he just he smiled and, and, and nodded, um, didn't, didn't say anything else. And that, that was the end of the AAR and we all went our separate ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and uh, as, as far as, uh, trying to stay kosher with, uh, Mario th- throughout all the times going out with, with his hand crew, um, the, the, the 40 mile fire, it was kind of, kind of my, my own personal lessons learned about the 40 mile fire and going on uh, crew seven one and not having a bad relationship with my superior because we've seen what happened, what the potential, what could potentially happen with the 40 mile fire and people, um, take sides, nothing gets done. And if shit hits the fan, people lose their lives. So, and especially with that, with the lack of experience on, on, on the crew, that could definitely have been a possibility on an uncontrollable contained fire. Oh yeah. hundred percent, man. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that, that's pretty much the, uh, the end of it. Uh, as far as, uh, what, what I took away from that, from a positive note, I, I, I thought it, at the end of the fire season, I thought even with all the bullshit I had gone through and, um, for, for better or worse, I thought that was probably my highlight of the season was that I might have saved some, someone's life and I took a lot of pride in that. And then uh, once I started getting these uh, EEO documents, um, I discovered that the way it was framed, Mario uh, initiated the medical and said that I had a bad attitude and I was yelling at him and I had a shit work ethic. And uh, he, he, he told that to Stroberg and Stroberg just wanted a um, document uh, of, of evidence for that um, because obviously they were uh, trying to build a case against me to hire to not hire me for the 2021 season. Um, but you know, straight, straight, even the judge noted Stroberg did no fact checking. He, he, he did no uh, interview with, with Mario to get the details. He did no interview with myself to get the details. He did no interview with anybody else on, on that on that fire to get details. So, uh, based on the uh, evidence of, of the other witness testimony from someone else who was on Crew Seven One, and uh, he, he decided that, uh, yeah, the uh, strong, strong motive for, for retaliation on Strober's part, but uh, no evidence on Mario for his statements uh, saying that I was a troublemaker, essentially, and a bad work ethic. So I'm reading through the uh, court document here mm-hmm. and I'm kind of like following along with your story. 
And yeah, I'm, I'm looking at this. The appellate alert, uh, returned from this little soda fighter and Groding reported to Stroberg that the appellate had a negative attitude in his belief that he was bringing down morale of the crew. And there was no, it basically goes on to say that there, everybody else who testified on your behalf uh, said, no, you never had a bad attitude. So yeah, man, that's, that's right. And it, it, was, yeah. it was just because I, I, I bruised Mario's ego. So he, he wanted to come back with, oh, yeah, this guy had a bad attitude. Um, he was a bad, bad worker. Um, just things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I had a lot of support from uh, people who were, who actually work uh, in, in fire, who gave, who gave me that testimony. I'm super appreciative of them for, 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 for that testimony. Um, I, think just as far as documents for, for, from my side, I think that little soda fire incident uh, is, is the most important because I, I think it takes away, it really puts a hole in a lot of Stro Strober's arguments. Like Strober saying I had a bad attitude on that fire when I was going through all the peak bullshit with management and not being wanting to be on seven one that showed that, you know, I was, I was still able to, to perform my duty. I was able to potentially save someone's life. Um, I was able to take a role as, as, as a leader and uh, keep these group, these people safe, um, have a good eye, make sure they're uh, make, 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 make sure they're, they're hydrated. Well, one of the, the things that's not in the in the um, judge decision that uh, I, I, I wish there's audio and, and video of. I'm not sure if there actually is or how to access it. Maybe I have to talk, talk to my attorney about that. Um, Drew Stroberg, when he was on the stand, um, he blamed the patient for getting rhabdo. He said that the, the patient should have drank more water. And that, that, that was the only time in the, in, the, in the court hearing I remember where there was a, just a collective silence. Like, how are you going to blame the victim not drinking enough water? Like, there's only so much water you can drink. Yeah. And it, 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 it just... And plus, they, well, water's a, a, that's like not the reason you get rhabdo rhabdo is a breakdown of your muscle tissue and your liver and your kidneys can't filter it out. And yeah. The rate that it's coming out. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the water yeah, obviously I mean, is going to help, but right. It's a bigger issue. This is physical activity. You're like right. you're working mean, yeah. yourself to death. Pretty much everything you're saying is the reason I was, uh, well, when he said that, that highlighted to me, the disconnect between firefighters and management, they, they, they have no clue and they don't want to have a clue. Um, the, yeah, like, like pretty much like you're saying, there, there, um, there's only so much water you can drink. Water isn't the only factor. Um, conditioning has a huge part in it. If, if, if the patient had five, seven seasons, he probably could have done that all, all day, especially if he was already on a hand crew. Um, but because he was a new firefighter and didn't have that conditioning, I, I, I think conditioning played a huge factor in why that happened to him. Um, and I, I, I think if we were out there for a couple of days longer, it probably would have been inevitable that there would have been multiple cases of, uh, of rhabdo because the, the guys, they, they were struggling. You could tell they were struggling. And everybody knows West Side of the Clam is a no joke. Um, so yeah, it was just, uh, it, it was really eye-opening to hear Stroberg uh, say what he said on the stand. I'm like shaking my head in silence right now for the people that are on the audio. <laughs> Oh man. I mean, I've dealt with rhabdo myself and unfortunately I've, I pushed some people too far and have actually been a contributing factor in them getting rhabdo, but I know how much of a joke or how much of a serious situation it is. It's not a joke. Rhabdo is some serious shit. Like I said earlier, it can kill you. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I, what I was doing, I, I felt like the, the, the crew boss Mario should have been doing, he should have been keeping an eye out on an inexperienced crew with no fire line experience, knowing he's going to be on the west side um, of people um, talking about aches and pains because it, it could just be, you know, aching, aching bones, aching muscles, but it could also be uh, a super early sign of uh, a dehydration and, and possibility of rhabdo. But um, it, he didn't seem like he was concerned about anything other than just getting on top of the hill the next day. Yeah, that mission blindness, man, that's... Mm -hmm. That's yeah. We all know what establishes as a leader. Yeah, I, I I think that's a big thing for him. Um, 
I think it's just that, that mission blindness. He's only thinking about that shift and the, and the next day, the next shift. He's not thinking about crew, crew fatigue, diminishing returns. Um, task focus. Yeah. Task focus. Um, uh, does he even go through with his, his 10th and 18th before engaging in the fire? I don't know. Probably not. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, once, once all that, that whole thing happened, it was really eye-opening of why people don't respect Mario, why Mario has issues uh, keeping a crew together. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I've said all, all I could say about the, the, the incidents. It's just, even now, I'm just kind of flabbergasted that it had to go to that, to that level. Well, it didn't have to. That's the thing. Is It never should have went there in the first place, but right. yeah. I, I think under a different uh, leadership, the crew boss, that wouldn't have happened. I mean, it's easy to postulate on that, but I mean, I get it, dude. I get it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I just mean from his, from his past history and his reputation. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I've never worked with any of these folks, of course, but I mean, right. we do have, uh, types of leaders out there that are just so, uh, task focused and they, uh, I guess that old school mentality of like, shut the fuck up and dig and don't mm -hmm. come to me with your problems. I don't want to hear them. That shit needs to die. In my opinion, that, that mentality, it needs to die. For, for the most part. Yeah. I, I, I think there's a time and a place for it. Like, if, if well, yeah. on a, Within reason there is absolutely. Uh, 100% okay. Agree with okay. You. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, you, if, you, if you're on an IA and you need to get ahead uh, of a fire and put a good flank on it and somebody's, you know, ask, Hey, I really need to go pee. <laughs> Just shut up and dig, you know, piss, piss your pants, you know, turn, turn around, pull, pull your pants down and take a piss real quick, but shut the fuck up and get to work. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it does kind of depend on the, on the situation. I, I don't want to say, yeah, just outright get rid of it, but yeah, but I, I think you said a good time and place for it. There is a time and place for it, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's with discretion, you know, right. you gotta take mm -hmm. care of your, if you take care of your subordinates, if you take care of the people under you, they're just going to work harder for you, man. That's leadership yeah. 101. Absolutely. So moving on to the next part of uh, this, uh, there was some issues right there about, you applying for not only the permanent positions as a uh, GS5, but also mm -hmm. uh, there were some behind the scenes conversations and uh, on your, let's see, it's a, in his resume, Appellate wrote that his objective was to disgruntled as perm, to be disgruntled as coworkers. Yeah, uh, objective to be as disgruntled as, as perm coworkers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there, there was a couple of things. In, in I can the, tell you were pissed board. when he said that. So, so, so he says, um, so with, with that resume, I actually got accepted to, to another forest, uh, Shasta Trinity National Forest. And I, I was second in line for a permanent position. If that person ended up taking a different offer or what have you, uh, I would have gotten called and gotten a position on there. So, uh, it, not only was it not super offensive to somebody else, it would almost land me a, a, a position in, in another forest. Um, I, I, I think there's def there was definitely a lot of playing up things for that resume to, to get rid of me. I, I think, uh, it, it, in a, in a sense, I kind of gave uh, Stroberg a golden ticket with, with that resume, um, because he obviously trying to get rid of me, but, uh, like, like the judge said in his decision, um, that application is actually separate from seasonal position. So while, um, Stroberg would have had a right to dismiss that application, uh, my seasonal hire is on a, uh, is, is completely separate from that. Yeah. There's two so, different lists. There's a merit and a DEU and they're different for perm and seasonal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, basically what it boiled down to was, uh, um, the, the, in the, the judge's ruling, he said that, uh, they made a one-time fairly unique decision not to hire me as a seasonal, uh, with a permanent application. And, uh, so that was, uh, um, uh, the judge felt that that was part of uh, re retaliatory motives. And but this whole like resume that you wrote, right? This is all post facto of the fire season that you endured with the soda fire and all that stuff, correct? Yeah, that was probably I probably uh, made that in August of 2020. So yeah, that was just a little bit after the soda fire stuff. So. Yeah, but I mean, do you bring up? I mean, I'm not advocating to um, you know 
write this in a resume if you're if you're trying to apply for a job. However, you bring up some great points here, honestly, and that's like that whole grassroots thing that we're talking about. I mean the whole ability to live off of $15 an hour since 2007. I thought that was a good one. I mean, yeah. Is it snarky and kind of shitheaded? Of course it is. But you know (laughs) what? I mean, that's, that's like the larger sentiment of a lot of the boots on the ground right now these days. So I get it, man. I'm, I'm, I get it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to put some clarification on the the resume, um, that, that resume, that that was essentially my, my Hail Mary because I was 39 at the time. Yeah. Uh, so age 40 is the hard cap. Doesn't matter what, how old you are after age 40 or how long you've been to the core service, uh, merit position waivers for age does not don't really apply for that. Well, it's 37 um, and a half, but it was 40 for you. Cause you already had temp time that you could apply towards that perm position, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, tell, tell HR that and we'll give you 20 different answers, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It's um, super hard to but, navigate. Uh, yeah. So I, I had, a. Uh, some uh overhead that i've worked with over the years and they have worked with uh regional hiring which for region five is in sacramento mm-hmm. and they've told me that the they they they, kind of, they like to see uh more personality and a bit of humor and set some of the resumes and that from, from what i've heard and what, what, I, what i've seen in one, one case in particular that has got, that have gotten people hired permanently uh th- throughout the years um so it, my, my my resume it you know, if, if you take out the sarcastic shithead bits in there, um, it, it, it's essentially the, the, the same. I believe there are things that were just kind of added to kind of put in a little more uh, sense of humor in it. You know, like I said, pretty much my, my, my last chance to get a permanent position because of my age. So um, I, 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 I just added those in there. I, I was reluctant to add those in there, which is why I didn't do it until my very last uh, eligibility for permanent hire. But uh, that, 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 that was what I ended up doing. And, uh, my, my, my mentality was, uh, you know, what's the worst thing they're going to do to hire me? Uh, yeah. Little did I know it was going to get way worse. <laughs> well, that's another, that's, that's another thing. Aside from all like the, the sarcastic stuff and the humor that you, element that you put into your resume mm-hmm. for the rest of it, it was professional. It was an actual resume. It was like, it was good resume, right? Yeah, I mean, there was the, the only thing that I had changed was I added those bits of sarcasm in the cover letter. And then the, the rest of the resume is just, yeah, I worked here and here for yeah. you know, 12, 13 seasons. Oh, so this was in your cover letter, not the resume itself. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 was, that was just my cover letter. So just the one page of that stuff. And then once you get into my actual resume of where, where I served, who I served with, what years. Yeah. It's um, there was none, none of that was, was in there. This, the, the cover letter was something I did in like, five, six minutes. And yeah. then like, okay, and then, nothing else I could change in the, in the application. I just turned the one nine into a two zero and that was, that was it, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the thing though, but the, the bigger picture here is that that cover letter with the sarcasm on it and the humor element was used as ammo as well to ultimately yeah. deny you of rehire rights for 2021, even as a temp seasonal. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Oh man. Okay. So they denied you rehire rights as a temp seasonal and you have no, uh, adverse actions. Your, I saw your performance eval. You got, uh, fully successful. I believe mm-hmm. is what it said in the document here. So yeah, fully, fully successful eval from my captain and, uh, the OPM, the email letters that you get, uh, was also fully successful. Okay. So there wasn't like a switcheroo or anything like that. Nope. Okay. Now you had a verbal reprimand, but there is a paper trail of documentation or was there any paper t- trail of documentation to justify their, uh, I guess, denial of rehire rights? Um, so the, uh, w- w- once the EO got started getting documentation, they, documentation from them, sorry. Um, the documentation that, that, I, that I saw was, um, they, they, they tried to paint the three weeks that I, that I was, uh, pissed off this run and I have a good attitude as my whole fire season. Um, there, there, there was a, an incident with a truck. Um, I, I had, uh, been dispatched to a fire that my engine was already on. I was serving as a type five incident commander on that same lava fire. Um, just by myself though, I wasn't three seven one that day. Um, as I was coming back, uh, we had some lightning. I, I was dispatched to join the, 
my, my crew on that fire because it was a fresh start. Um, they, were, they weren't able to give me a legal, but I had a good idea where it was at. And I, at, at the end of the day, to make one for sure, I, I, I went one turn too soon to the fire. So that one turn too soon was a dead end. And once I realized it was a dead end, I went to back out of it. It was, it was a narrow, narrow spot, you know, trying to keep my eyes out the best I could. Um, obviously, it wasn't good enough because I hit the rear passenger side, uh, it, it, it hit a tree, and it made a pretty good sized dent. In fact, the backlight was uh, shattered in the passenger side. Um, it was good indentation all along the back. But uh, it means that the, the car was still functioning, the truck was still functional. I wasn't injured. Um, so I, I proceeded and I took the next turn, which was the right one, and I tied into the to the fire with the with the engine. And uh, it, the, the the fire went relatively smoothly. Um, I was debate, debating on when to tell or how to tell my my captain. One because obviously once you get there, um, he's got firefighter twos under him. There's not a lot of experience on on, on the engine. Um, he's trying to speak with command. There's other incoming resources. I didn't want to overwhelm him with, with another thing. And, and anybody that's been on fire a couple of seasons knows that, especially when you're in lightning dispatch, um, if you, you're on that one fire, you could easily be dispatched into another to another lightning strike. I mean, it, it could be the start of a long season. I've been on plenty of shifts where we're, we're on a lightning plan and it turns into two days of chasing fires without, without rest. So I, I made a judgment right there, um, not to tell them until I knew we were going to be safe back at, at our station. And uh, so as, as we were making our, our way back out, it looked like it was probably going to be uh, dead for the rest of the day. It was probably about 10 o'clock at night. Um, I was like, so, okay, I'll have to break the news to him once we get back to the station. Um, there, there, there was a, another resource there. They didn't, their engine didn't have four wheel drive and they got stuck in the mud. So um, we were using a chain to try and get them free. And as we were trying to get them free, that was when my, uh, my, my captain noticed um, the accident to the back of the truck. And he asked me what was going on. And uh, that, that was when I, I gave him the story, like I just told you. And uh, he was like, well, why, why, why didn't you tell me? And then I told him why. And uh, he's like, well, I, I don't care what happens during the fire. Something like that happens, you need to tell me right away. And I, I understood his frustration, his anger about seeing that and not being told right away. But at the same time, the way it, I, I felt like he was put to task already with everything he was dealing with on that on that fire, being a fresh start especially. So I didn't think it was a good idea to, to let him know about it until uh, – uh, until I knew we were in the clear, especially with the lightning, lightning plan. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 he, he was pretty pissed. I let him yell at me until, until I felt like I was three feet tall. I did, I'll, I'll take responsibility. I deserved it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we, we, as we got back to the station, he called the Phil Borderland and I had a conversation with, with, with Phil Borderland and I uh, was told, you know, yeah, you need to report us as, as soon as it happens. And, uh, Little did either one of them know. Um, I told I told Broding, but I think he was just so mad and he was uh, not really listening to what I had to say. I, I shot a text out to my other captain, the county chief, and really, uh, as the accident happened, I took a picture and I sent it to him. And I told him, oops, had an accident, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I, the uh, text didn't go out until a couple hours later because, you know, we're in a rural area, don't have very good reception. But he, he he did get the uh, uh, text. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, Stroberg and management tried to pass it off as me not reporting an accident and not you know trying trying to hide an accident essentially. Um, so yeah, when my uh, captain went, went, went on the stand, he refuted all that. It's like no, I, I got a text message from him. He, he, he did report it. And then when Stroberg was on the stand, they asked them like. Were you aware that Rios had sent a text out to the battalion chief informing of an accident? And Strober wrote, no, I didn't know. Mm. And it's, just, it's just another one of those things. Like Strober did any kind of investigating part of his job as a district ranger. He, 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 he would have known about all this. So 
all of this just because of a a door, not even a door, it's a bumper, right? It was it was the back end, a back passenger side of the truck. It, it was the bed and the door, the, the back bed trailer, uh, the tailgate, sorry, still still open. It was just the passenger side was pretty smashed. And they're gonna do this. I mean, sorry, man. Uh, no, I, I'm not gonna I, lie. I'm not gonna I, lie, I, dude. I've smashed the shit out of some uh, government vehicles before, and uh, dude, I, I've known people who've smashed the shit out of fucking vehicles who are now permanents. I've I've seen people do it while they're permanents. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That shit happens, though. It's like you can't. As long you do, you, you, in my opinion, I mean, I wouldn't want to tell my captain or my FMO or whoever you know, or my FOS during a lightning bus, be like. Hey, dude, uh, we need to take care of this right now because it's not the time or place, man. Right. If it's shitting and getting on a lightning bust, a packed mm-hmm. lightning bust, I'd be like, hey, man, after this, we got to talk about this. So, I mean, I would wait right. for a little while. I, I, that, I get it. I get it, man. But also, you already have this kind of like feeling that I, I can only assume that you have this feeling that you're under the microscope and that you're being watched and they're just, I don't know, my, looking at you with every little thing to document. So I can understand that I, I would be kind of afraid to tell him because I could see like the snowball effect kind of rolling already, you know? Yeah. You know, when, 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 when that happened, um, I, I didn't necessarily feel like I was, I was under a mic- microscope. I was like, shit, this is the last thing I want to tell my, my captain because the, the captain, like I said, there was these changes in my main captain was battalion chief and my um, captain it was his first year as captain. Um, I, I felt su- I still to this day I still feel super bad for him because um, all the shit that happened had nothing to do with him. He he, he didn't deserve yeah. this. Is the, this is his first year as a captain. It's got to be stressful as hell dealing with all this stuff. And then um, yeah, an accident like that happened with, with, with the truck. It's like fuck, oh, man, this is not going to be good for, uh, for for my relationship with my captain. That's already fractured with with, with the COVID stuff. Uh, with the you know talking to me one on one about the attitude and, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this was just another cog in, in, in the wheel on that front. Um, but I mean, uh, as, as far as anything goes with that captain, I mean, I, I, have, I have no hard feelings Ill, Ill will, will towards, towards that guy. I, I think he's a great guy. But like I said, I, I followed him into, into any fire. It just that year was just, it, it, it was a shit year. Um, you know, on, on multiple fronts for, for, for COVID, um, for, for me, dealing with management, um, for my you know, worrying about my, my son, um, there, there, there was a lot of factors. Um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm super apologetic to my captain and how they go through all that, especially his first season of the captain. He didn't deserve any of that. Yeah. I mean, either way, though, that the, at the end of the day, man, like, what the, f- what the fuck is going right. on here? Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's the thing, man. It's like, and I'm looking through your, the court document right now, and it's, it's saying that, the uh office of special counsel or was was contacted and uh it was alleged that the agency did not hire you rehire you for the 2021 season because of the july 8th 2020 social media post now that's a that's yeah you can't do that that's a whistleblower protected uh action you're not rever- and also you're off duty as well Right. So um, part, part of the documentation that, that that's released from, from the EEO investigation was the fact that they had multiple meetings about me and my social media posts. And there was a guy uh, who, uh, I, I forget exactly what his, his title was, but um, is Jack Fisher. Um, he had a, a, a authority over what was offensive to the CFR and what wasn't in these documentations that I had. And he noted to the Klamath National Forest Management that my post did not offend the, the, the CFR and that it was likely a whistleblower protected act. He didn't conclusively say it was, but looking at the documentation, my, my, my post, um, he said that as frustrating as it is, it's uh, likely under whistleblower protection. Yeah, it's... Uh... Under the whistle, uh, I'll read the part of it here that says it's under the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 2012, the WEPA. 
uh, WPEA, the board has jurisdiction over an IRA appeal if the appellate has exhausted the administrative remedies before OSC makes non frivolous allegations that, one, they are made by protected disclosure pursuant to 5 USC, blah, 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 uh, or they have engaged in a protective activity described under 5 USC uh, 2302B9A. One dash B, C, D, and two. That's a lot of CFRs. And if you know how to yeah. read legal code, well, that's kudos to you. But uh, disclosure or protective activity was a contributing factor in the agency's decision to take or fail to take a personnel action as defined by five, blah, 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 blah. The precedent case would be Kerrigan versus Department of Labor. Um, goes on to say it's actually got a, a ton of precedent cases. And basically, at the end of the day, this action that they tried to uh, deny you rehire rights under was a, was not a prohibited action on your part. Mm-hmm. So, and there's like a ton of other stuff that is mentioned in here, and there's a ton of uh, case precedents, and it all involves. I mean, there's one here from the Social Security Administration, the Air Force. Homeland Security, Department of Labor. It goes on and on and on and on and on because they have to disclose all this stuff in, yeah. uh, in the judgment there or the, uh, the verdict. But yeah, man, I mean, as far as it goes with you, I mean, I'm just reading off the court document right now and kind of scanning through it. But from your understanding, how did this whole thing play out and how did it, how did it all go down with you? Um, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean specifically? Like what was, if you were talking to say I was, uh, or say I was you and you were the lawyer, your lawyer, right? Explain it to me like I'm five. How did this whole thing like work and why were you protected? Um, so I mean, I I think it says in the the, the judge's decision, so that there there was two, um, two different, uh, arguments that that I had made that the judge went through. One of them was that I, I felt it constituted gross mismanagement. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the, the the plague was <laughs> the plague the, the plague. COVID thing was uh, it, it was recognized by the U.S. government as a public health safety uh, right uh, public yeah, health as, right. A, as a, a public health issue throughout throughout the U.S. and um, I constituted it as gross mismanagement because uh, Climate National Forest Management didn't have any protocols to protect from a COVID hot zone from a recognized um, health hazard across the U.S. Um, the, the, the judge denied that as the whistleblower status status claim because uh, gross mismanagement um, refers more to being able to adhere to their mission statement and uh, their, their, their their mission statement doesn't have anything really to do with uh, Um, taking care of firefighters and for, for isolation, you know, there, there wasn't, uh, it, 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 it didn't go against uh, protecting the lands it was another, probably a bit, 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 better point. Um, so because it didn't constitute that, there, there wasn't gross mismanagement. Um, a, another argument that I had made was there, that there was an immediate threat to the public safety and that's where the judge ultimately agreed with me on. Um, so because of that singular one, um, does that have to fall under every possible whistleblower scenario? It just has to fall under one. And because of the threat to public safety, it fell under whistleblower protection. Yeah, because I'm reading through the uh, gross mismanagement thing, and it's he has the judge has the justification of why he can't agree with that necessarily uh-huh. but right below that in the next uh argument where is it yes yeah, yeah uh substantial and or substantial and specific danger to public health and safety and that's where the uh judge ultimately agreed with your your claim your case mm-hmm. yeah so and this is long i'm on page 15 of shit 30 something yeah it's a big read 41 and, and you know like like i said you know, all this right here, that's what that's condensed down from all this documentation. There's hundreds of pages here. Yeah. God, man, this is crazy. This is a long document, man. And then all the, yeah, there's the, 
actual court order. But this, the thing is, is that we always have this, like this anvil over our heads pretty much about, uh, speaking out or we always get social media and stuff like that posted over, like, like hung over our heads. Like I, 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 and some of it is, you know, like obviously if you post a photo of someone's house that burnt down and right. they weren't notified or you posted right. something about, uh, like a, like a fatality fire, right. Mm -hmm. Before it was publicly disclosed, then you can get right. your ass in trouble. And that makes sense yeah. to me. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of people, I've seen a couple of people in my crew over the years get fired. Um, not, not too many, only two, but I mean, they, they, put, they posted some, what they thought was some pretty innocuous stuff it turned out to have people's uh, homes in them. Um, they weren't identifiable address, but if you knew the location, you could identify it. Yeah. And that got them in hot water anyway. And they ended up getting fired. Yeah. I mean, there is, uh, this, I guess you have to use discretion is what I'm getting at. You know I mean? Like, mm -hmm. don't just start taking photos of shit that you, I, you may not always think twice about it. Right. And that, that makes sense to me, but I mean, no. what you did and the repercussions that you faced further down the line after this whole thing was like posted and it's, you know, out there, I mean, that's, I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody should do this because there is a, there is a chance that you are not going to have that, that person's not going to have the same outcome as you, but this stuff happens all the time. And there's like, mm -hmm. These whistleblower protections, they, act, they happen, they, they're there for a reason, for instance, for you, which it worked out in your favor. But also what about the other stuff, like failure to do uh, actual gross mismanagement stuff, right? Which you didn't right. get, right? But yeah, the, the, so the public yeah, the gross safety, gross yeah. Mismanagement one, um, the, the, the judge cited uh, the Forest Service mission statement, which mm -hmm. had to do with protecting the, uh, so serving the public and protecting the land, something of that nature. And uh, the judge ruled that that wasn't uh, necessarily a whistleblower protected act mm -hmm. under under that uh, reasoning for gross management. But yeah, the specific danger to public health. Not my reasoning there is where he sided with me. Yeah, but the thing is, is like these whistleblower things happen all the time. Like things that are legitimately yeah. uh, reportable under whistleblower protection act, mm -hmm. like things like sexual assault or harassment or uh, yeah, yeah, wrongful and, termination. And, and, and in my opinion, and I never talked to this about my attorney, but I'm really interested in fraud. And you know, when you put in a 16 hour shift and go to finance and you rip it up, especially when, especially when it's signed by someone who was on the ground. Um, yeah. I've, I've seen people stand up to that. Um, they do get their 16, but then they're kicked off the fire with the next shift. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a whistleblower protected act. That's, that'd be something I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, now that this is all behind me and uh, uh, exploring, I wonder if I could talk to my attorney about that. Yeah, I'm about to say if uh, your attorney wants to join us and explain how all this works, because I, 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 I guess what I'm getting at is there's a lot of people out there that have uh, done the right thing and have mm -hmm. suffered the consequences for it. I don't know if right. that's necessarily whistleblower or if that's something else that they'd be protected under, but I've seen people get fired for bullshit reasons because, well, mm -hmm. they spoke out. Yeah, that's. Exactly. And that's, that's the bigger that's thing, the only, right? The only uh, crime is just speaking out. Yeah. And I think that's the bigger picture thing too, is that, that, that culture of fear and that culture of reprisal and fear of reprisal, it, mm. it's, it's coming to a head. And I think people are finally getting pissed. And when your story broke that you won your case for the whistleblower protection, that moved a lot of people. And I think it empowers people is what I'm getting at. It, it empowers people to be proactive in doing what's right. We're always from the day we step foot in fire, we're always told do what's right, duty, respect, integrity, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how come that's a one way street with some of these places? You know? Well, because most of the people in forest service management, they never went into fire in the first place. So they never heard that. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, we do have a paramilitary organization ran by people with, you know, doctorates never set foot in the mm -hmm. fire line. But that's, right. that's, that's a completely different, larger story, right? That's a yeah. completely different subject. As far as you go, where, where does it go from here from, for you? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. So I, I mean, the, 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 the fact that I even won the case, um, it, you know, just recently, uh, you know, once, uh, once everything was finalized with the attorney and, and the defense about settlement, 
um, it, it, re- it really landed home that, yeah, I actually fucking won after almost a year and a half of going through this. Um, so I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the next plans are. I, I know there's people out there that want to hear my story, and I'm, I'm more than happy to be as open as possible to make time um, for a- anybody that wants to hear what I went through um, and how I ultimately became victorious. Um, de- so totally open to uh, um, ha- have, have, have interviews with, with, with people about that, uh, especially because I know how important this is to the wildfire community. This definitely is, it is a precedent. Um, and I, I, I hope, and I, I, know, I know two people who have come to me and uh, told me that uh, because of what I went through and winning the retaliation case, it inspired them to actually uh, look into uh, their, 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 own, their own case for, for their own grievances. Um, but I, I sent you the, the email to, to one of them. It's a person that was in fire uh, for the park service, wants yeah. to do, it, do an interview with me. Um, uh, that's supposed to happen on, on Monday. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's awesome to hear. I, I love that. That's uh, not, not, not the main reason I, I, I had done it. Um, I was pissed off and I, I wanted justice. And, uh, but you know, now, now that I have that justice, if uh, people can get a piece of it too, go for it. And that's the thing is the power is really in your hands. I mean, yeah, not all of them are going to uh, be a sink, you know, a, a bucket shot and like scoring that triple that, that three pointer from the, uh, from the line. Right. But yeah, I mean, that's where your attorney comes in and that's where the important part is to have legal uh, defense as well, or not legal defense, but yeah, legal representation. Representation. Yeah. And uh, as far as uh, attorneys go, um, I, I, I sunk, my own money into securing my, my own defense attorney and that was thousands of dollars oh, yeah. so i mean if you if you're really serious about pursuing any action against management um be prepared to put in a bit of your own money um l- luckily for for me it, 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 uh, i knew tax season wasn't too far off so it wasn't going to hit as hard but i mean it's it's a bit of money especially when you're when you're a gs4 grade and you know you got to secure x this x amount of money for for your attorney, but uh, I, I highly recommend if anybody is really serious about it, don't talk to a friend and don't talk to a friend of a friend. Secure a lawyer. It's going to cost money, but if you really believe in your case, it's going to be worth it. Well, yeah, and when you talk to an attorney, they're going to screen your case and they're going to look at the burden. Yeah, of actually, yeah, I was, I was vetted thoroughly. Yeah, you'll get vetted through the attorney, right? Now, if you have yeah. a legitimate case to where it's a a, a thing that they or have a good chance of winning because whistle it even says in the court documents uh, that whistleblower claims are very hard to win. Mm-hmm. It even says that in here. Yeah. However, there might be opportunities for some, some attorneys to do pro bono and pro bono work is or a contingency work rather not pro bono pro bono is for free, but uh contingency, like the work off of a contingency. So if it actually goes to court, and there is a settlement or something like that, they're going to take a cut or if not all of it, but yeah, be prepared to pay up some money yeah, for if, these, if, for these attorneys, if, if, man. They're expensive. Serious. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had some people DM me about, um, go, go, going, going through legal grounds to, uh, go after the forest service. And, you know, what, one, one thing they tell me is, uh, you know, they're talking to friends who are attorneys or friends of friends who are, you know, attorneys. You now, if, if you're really serious about it, you got to put your money where your mouth is. You got to put in those thousands of dollars in security training. Um, I, I'd like to give out how much I spent. I don't know, uh, kind of private with, with, with my attorney, so I don't want to put him on blast. Um, I don't know if, if he has a varying rate or what, what have you, but uh, um, just be, be prepared to spend in a good chunk, chunk of money on, on, on an attorney if you're serious. But like I said, it was well, well, well worth it. Oh, yeah, man. Well, Thank you for telling your story and telling us how this whole uh, this whole incident kind of went down and the remedies to it. I mean, that's huge. I mean, there are options for the people out there that have something similar going on or maybe mm-hmm. something uh, completely different that maybe they spoke out about something else that got them fired. And if it was like yeah. a legitimate concern to where it's a a reprisal thing, well, then you might have legal grounds to fight back. And that's a big thing because a lot of people are scared to do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there, there's a, uh, Oh, just over the years, you know, I've, I've had captains try to challenge, you know, what, what, what hazard pay would constitute 
Yeah, because they're, they're 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 driving in, in the snow, going to a medical. The, the roads are slick, but I, that doesn't constitute hazard things. Like how you know we're we're in a 50,000 pound vehicle. We're, we're on unsafe roads. We're responding to a medical where there's inevitably fluids from the other person. How is that not constituting hazard things? Like why why is finance being so stingy about getting us what's very very very, very basic? You know, obviously, okay, there's road hazards, there's fluid hazard. That should be hazard pay. You know, when when a sawyer is chap, chopping up and doing a project work and just following a tree, you know, they're not getting hazard pay. Like, why aren't they getting hazard pay here? Literally geared up. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're, 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 they're competitive. You know, anything goes wrong with this tree if they miss the, any kind of a, a, a disease kill on, on, on the tree, the tree go, go the wrong way, you know. It, it's just, it, I don't understand why they fight so hard to not let us have hazard pay. And it, it, it's actually a really interesting that I, thing that I found out just last year when I went back to the private sector fire. Um, I'm on a company that does uh, daily rates. So it doesn't matter if I work 10 hours a day, 12, 16, I, 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 get, a, I get a daily rate. And uh, the, the, the equivalent of the daily rate that I had gotten, um, was, I, was, I was an engine boss trainee, so I got a little more, but I'll, I'll go back to the equivalent. A firefighter one daily rate last year was uh, 300 a day. If, if, I, if I was a GS4, um, I'd have to, I think, meet 15 hour shifts to beat that rate. And uh, on, on an engine, you're, you're not guaranteed 15 hours I've got, or 16 hours. I've got 15, 14s on, on the shift because I don't know if I'm a little more stingy, stingy with the. Uh, engines than they, are, than they are on hand crews but uh i mean that that daily rate is that i'm making more money than i was with support service at, at the gs4 just that firefighter one rate because all the engine boss made a little more but uh, the, the the comparative rates are pretty insane I, i've seen as, as much as a 750 a day daily rate for engine captain oh wow like, wow that's way more than four <laughs> four service gives and uh, yeah, you, you, even even with step increases, step the, the feds give you after a while, um, it's hard to beat that. It's, you know, six fifty, seven hundred, and seven fifty rate. And uh, with, with Biden's infrastructure proposal, um, everybody should be getting decent raises this year. We'll see how, how well that holds with inflation. But uh, the the, the, pri- the private sector, I didn't know until uh, January, February, the private sector got adjustments on their rates as well. So from what I've seen. Uh, Firefighter two, if you've never had boots on the ground, their daily rate will be three forty three daily. And it's like, wow, <laughs> that's pretty sweet. That's pretty good, man. And that, that's yeah. a whole bigger picture thing, though. This is just like the the fear of reprisal, the whistleblower, the pay, the uh, benefits for like buying back your temp time for retirement or. Mm-hmm mental health or health benefits year round for temp seasonals, man. That's, that's where all this grassroots stuff comes in, man. Yeah. And I, I, I had actually gotten screwed over on a, a, a permanent position. Um, so in 2019, uh, this kind of circles into uh, 2020 stuff as far as the EEO stuff goes. Um, in October, November, 2019, I had been accepted for a position on Fredonia, Fredonia Arizona. Uh, for a, a demo position, and uh, I don't really know what demo if it stands for something, but essentially you don't have to put in the five thousand hours of apprenticeship time. You're just yeah. for a full time. There's permit. DEU and uh, merit, so demo is DEU. I, I want to say I think um, someone okay. correct me if I'm demo? wrong. Yeah, demo demographic demo. Uh, it's okay. just like anybody can put in for that merit. You have to be you have to have previous um, experience or previous uh, SF fifty. I believe. I believe that's okay. how it works. Okay. Yeah, but uh, anyway, I had gotten a demo position for Dummy Arizona. Um, I, I accepted the, the position. I, I had had my hand, my hand shipped by in near every permanent on, on the district, uh, Houston has district. And then I hadn't heard anything for about a month. And so I called them back up, like I said, about October, November 2019. And I had uh, been told that the, the position was taken away from me and that they didn't have any details from it. I just called uh, Fredonia, Arizona. Uh, I don't know, I forget what forest they're on, but I, I called the forest and they didn't have any details for me, but uh, that was the, the, the news that I was given. And I was just thinking, it'd be nice to get a fucking notice, you know, <laughs> me, me and my my wife and we were moving our kid and we were looking at places in uh, Kaibal, Utah and 
the hurricane Utah, we were pretty dead set on trying to find a place in between that area or plan on making a big life change. So it would have been nice to be notified. But I called the uh, human resources and asked what the details were. And it turns out in 2019, I was 38. Um, demo positions aren't available for people age 37, 37 and, and, and over. And uh, yeah, so once so I got that information, uh, I put, put, put in a complaint um, and it took a while, but I finally got a hold of someone and they said that the, you know, the hiring council you know, they did their best to, to, to try and get you in. Um, but because you were over their age limit, you didn't qualify for it. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, that was pretty, it was annoying the fact that it was taken away. It was also annoying about the fact that they didn't even bother to, to notify me. They had to dig to find out what the details were. Um, so that, that, that was when I initially filed a, a complaint with the, with the EEO. Um, because I've been ha- having so many hiring issues. I, I feel like every time I had a hiring issue, I called HR to get it sorted out so that when it happened again, there'd be a new thing. It's like they're trying to have excuses not, not to hire me for whatever reason. And, but, but believe it or not, before this COVID incident, I was pretty quiet under, under the radar guy. I never had any issues. I always had good eval. I was great rapport with, with everybody I worked with. So uh, I, I don't know who I could piss off and <laughs> not want to go to great lengths not to hire me for a full time position. But uh, yeah, so um, anyway, I had gotten a hold of this EEO, and this take, getting a hold of this EEO took a long time um, because it, there's different types of EEOs. There's state EEOs, there's federal EEOs, and then there's federal EEOs that are only only have so much jurisdiction and certain range. So uh, the first EEO I had gone through was in uh, San Francisco. That wasn't the correct EEO. I went to another one in Washington. That wasn't the correct EEO. I went to a, a EEO in the D.C. area. That wasn't the correct EEO. And uh, so fi- finally, uh, fourth or fifth time to charm, I got the correct EEO in Atlanta, Georgia, of all places. And uh, so that this woman, uh, I, I gave her my, my grievances. And then by, by the time it essentially went forward, it was probably July, no, August of 2020. So this was on top of all the shit I had already gone through with management, being on 7-1. Uh, the vehicle accident, um, and the the case never went forward with that claim because I was on the August complex, which is the Mendocino that burnt for a million acres. Yeah. Um. So I so I had missed the the, the mail that that had come to me, and my wife she doesn't really know the special anything special that's coming from me, so she didn't think twice to tell me what when when I got home. But I had looked through some stacks of paper and. Uh, October, no, no, in December of 2020, because I called the same EEO for the uh, um, cases that, that I ultimately won. Um, and I had told, told her, no, I, I never got anything about it. And she said, well, we sent you something in August of 2020. You never get it? I was like, well, I was on fire, so I might have missed it. And eventually I looked through a bunch of old uh, document, doc, old mail, and it was in the middle of all that old mail. So it never went forward because I was on fire and missed it. But uh, that the, happens all the, the time, uh, though, man. That's like it's one of those things. It's like it needs to be more streamlined and more efficient. Like, well, the th- things need to be made, and I don't know how much. In the guy, I'm, I'm, I'm sure military and personnel have the same issue, but it'd be great if they could streamline things more for firefighters because you know we're emergency sector. We don't know where we're going to be a lot of times, especially in that uh, August complex. There's no reception anywhere in, in, in Mendocino. A lot of those um, fires, there's no reception. It's like. Yeah, I mean, and then you have a you have apprenticeship hiring, and obviously you have to try and find reception for. You know, so I, I, I found out a couple of years ago, uh, BLM they do their hiring in January. It's like, why doesn't Forest Service do that? What the hell? But uh, yeah, so uh, um, my 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 issues with hiring kind of culminated with that that demo position. I, I ended up filing, filing an EO complaint, got dismissed because I missed the mail that came uh, my way, which was only a fourteen day deadline. So I probably would have missed it regardless. Um, but yeah, it, it was actually thank, thanks to all that, um, process that I was able to immediately find an e, the, the EEO once I got the call from Strober that he wasn't hiring me for the next season. So if it wasn't for that, I probably would have been another month or two from being able to, to do any kind of filing because I didn't have the person to contact and they, they don't make it easy to contact. 
No. I, I, I was I was thinking about making an Instagram post posting the person's EEO number, but knowing the federal government will probably catch it, change the number. <laughs> so and if, if people have any complaints that they want to file through the right way, I'll be happy to give you the my attorney's number and EEO numbers. And that's the thing, is like a lot a lot of this information is not readily available to the and they make it that way. They make it that way. Yeah. It's like trying to get EAP benefits. Mm-hmm. Not really widely advertised of how to do this, right? So right. you got to do some digging. You got to put in a lot of work. You got to put in a lot of miles with yeah. you know, both your brain and your your fingers is typing, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's it's the uh, the information, albeit buried, it is out there. But it definitely helps to have help from an attorney. That's for damn sure. Yeah, absolutely. And like, like I said, if anybody wants to DM me about the uh, my, my, my attorney or the EEO process. Um, you can DM me on uh, Instagram at uh, Rio Stigo, Jets Two T's. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. I'm not as active on there. Uh, Tito Tito Abel. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to help anybody that wants to try and, uh, um, not let Forest Service get away with it and get the right with. Hell yeah, man. Well, it looks like we're getting towards the end of the show, man. And, uh, yeah, as a, Per tradition, I always uh, give you the opportunity to give a shout out to some homies, heroes, mentors before we go. So who do you got for us, man? Um, let's see. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of on, on the fence. Uh, you know, I, I don't really want to put too many people on blood. I don't want forest service management to hear this. Okay, we're going to target these people next. So uh, and, and anybody that, that's worked with me over the years, uh, from Firestorm to uh, forest service to the, the uh, AD uh, crews, you, you you know who you are. Uh, I, th- I think about you guys a lot. Um, I hope, hope you guys have been watching my case. Um, stay safe out there if, if you're not in fire, but you still keep tabs. Hope you're happy doing what you're doing now. Hell yeah. Well, Pedro, aka Tito. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pedro, thank you so much for being on the show, man, and sharing your story. It's definitely uh, powerful stuff. And, you know, I hope it helps uh, some people out there that are experiencing some similar things that you went through, or if not worse, I mean, yeah, I know there's a lot of people out there that have some bullshit that they're going through and they probably need some, uh, some justice, some closure as well. And I hope that your story inspires them to seek that. Yeah, definitely. And thank you for doing what you do with your Anchor Point podcast. It's been awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you so much once again. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, get we'll keep talking, man. We'll uh, get you off the show and we'll see you on the next one. So everybody stay safe out there. Later. And boom, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Anchor Point podcast is in the books with my good friend, Mr. Pedro Rios. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, explaining what happened and giving your take on the situation. I mean, yeah, this is all public knowledge and it's all pretty much laid out there in the, uh, I guess, public lawsuit. Yeah, I don't know what you would call that. I don't speak legalese, but whatever paper comes with the judgment or whatever it is. So yeah, you can all go. I'll actually, you know what? I'm, in fact, I'm gonna put a link to the uh, actual judgment and uh, what the judge say, the, the said, the, the case, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, right? I'll put some links in the show notes in case you want to uh, check it out. But Pedro, dude, thank you so much. I'm sure that your uh, story is going to help some other people because I know there is a big fear of reprisal out there. Unfortunately, it happens. Um, yeah, it sucks. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess you're going to be moving on to uh, greener pastures, hopefully. So for anybody listening to this, take some notes. Uh, hopefully this doesn't happen to you, but if it does do have some options. So with that being said, for all those folks out there on the line, I hope you're uh, staying safe, staying healthy and staying sane. I know this uh, season started off pretty dang early and it's probably going to be a long one. So buckle up for the uh, long haul. It's going to be a wild one. Stay safe out there. Special shout out to our sponsors. We've got Mystery Ranch, purveyors of the finest damn packs in the land. Mystery Ranch built for the mission. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Backbone series, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check out all they have to offer, especially you ladies if you're looking for a new yoke or a women's specific fit yoke, that is. We got Hot Shop Brewery, kick ass coffee for kick ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So go over to www. 
hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. We've got the ass man himself over at the ass movement, Mr. Micah Boos. Go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement where you can get 10% off your entire order, order site wide with the code anchor point ass 10. And last but not least, we've got Bethany, my homie over at the Smoky Generation. She's doing her thing. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, the apps for the Smoky Generation Grants 2022 are going to end here May 20th. So I highly suggest motivating yourself and going over to www.wildfireexperience.org and putting your apps in. As for the rest of you, y'all know the drill. Stay safe, stay savage. Peace.